नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू इंडियन डिप्लोमेसी शो ऑन दूरदर्शन इंडिया नेशनल टेलीविजन चैनल अबाउट इंडियन फॉरेन पॉलिसी इंडिया इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन एंड इंडिया मेजर स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप्स एंड इनिशियटिव इन डिफरेंट रीजन ऑफ द वर्ल्ड व्यूअर्स इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर टेकिंग अप द फिनम ऑफ इंडिया नेबरहुड फर्स्ट पॉलिसी दिस इज वन ऑफ द सिग्नेचर इनिशियटिव ऑफ द नरेंद्र मोदी गवर्नमेंट सिंस टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन एंड हैज यील्टेड इनॉर्मस रीजनल इंटीग्रेशन uh effects and positive benefits for all the members of south asia and the extended neighborhood of india so we're going to be talking about uh, india's neighborhood first policy how it has uh, panned out uh, in the last 10 years uh, what have been the problems uh, in executing the neighborhood first policy and uh, what is the future of neighborhood first for india and to discuss this uh, i have two very talented and knowledgeable uh, scholars joining me in the studio today let me introduce you to them i have with me uh, dr gulbin sultana she is um, associate fellow at the manohar parikar institute for defense studies and analysis uh, dr sultana welcome to thank India you in diplomacy thank you and also with me today is dr shabana barwa who is research fellow at the indian council for world affairs another important think tank welcome dr barwa thank you so much professor shaudia dr sultana let me start with you um, it's been 10 years we've had uh, this uh, policy framework called neighborhood first um high level of political uh, attention has been paid to the neighborhood since 2014 at the level of prime minister external affairs minister uh, so many other you know prominent uh, diplomats uh, and policy makers from india have been involved in revving up this relationship and taking it to the next level um and the whole idea was to integrate all these countries and to show india's leadership in the region to connect them uh, through trade through commerce uh, people to people culture and uh, also providing security for these countries as they go forward in their own developmental pathways so um, at the outset how do you think we have done in our neighborhood first policy thus far um i think uh, neighborhood first policy when it was uh, initiated in 2014 um it actually gave it, it this policy it was we always i think had a neighborhood policy but uh, by saying uh, you know Uh, neighborhood first policy i think that emphasis has been given more it we conveyed to the our, to our neighbors that yes now we are giving more focus and i think it was started when uh, uh, prime minister modi's oath taking ceremony where all the uh, leaders were invited mm -hmm. for the oath taking ceremony and that's how it started and um, by neighborhood first policy we reiterated i think government of india reiterated uh, its commitment to develop friendly relation uh, based on mutual uh, benefit uh, to its uh, each other and uh, subsequently we have seen in last 10 years we have um, uh, invested um, um uh, for this um, uh, for developmental infrastructure mm -hmm. security cooperation we try to in, increase our uh, you know people to people contact it at various levels so we have been doing it uh, but somehow i think um, the outcome is not as much as we expected because uh, we mm. have seen there are issues in bilateral relations with our immediate neighbors uh, so i think uh, that is the problem um, while the intention of this neighborhood first policy uh, uh, is is to develop friendly relations and uh, uh, strengthen the relations but somehow i think somewhere there are some issues which i'm sure we are going to uh, discuss sure. uh, in a while so uh, uh, because of those issues we have to address those issues to i think to uh, actually see the result of this neighborhood first policy sure uh, let me bring in uh, dr barwa um so we've been doing this for 10 years now and uh, there is a visible impact on the ground uh, we have affected the lives of millions of uh, people in south asia um, and also adjoining on to, on to the right which is the, we have myanmar and thailand and so on so there is there we have a number of uh, you know institutions through which we have been doing this there has been there is the sark which is somewhat uh, defunct or moribund but there is also bimstech and uh, so many other we have created um, a smaller subgroup called bbin uh, bangladesh right. bhutan india nepal so if you look at it there is an architecture uh but uh, as dr uh, sultana is saying there have been some issues as well but overall i think uh, if you look back in time and say okay india was there india was the biggest power in the region 
and everyone had expectations about India, but we seem to have delivered a lot of things, uh, especially the developmental assistance we were just mentioning. And on that front, uh, the people in these countries, I mean, we'll come to the regimes in these countries, but the people, ordinary people, seem to generally have had a favorable view of India. Right. And I think that is a very big plus point, isn't it? What do you think? I think, uh, uh, Professor Cholli, I would like to bring in two points. Firstly, as uh, Dr. Sultana has already mentioned, there are issues, no doubt. Uh, the biggest one of them when it came about in 2014 uh, was that India is acting up like a big brother. That mm. is why SAC became defunct beyond the Pakistan-India issues that we have had. Uh, and to be uh, remembered is the fact that in fact when we were studying as young scholars, uh, we talk about continuity and changes in Indian foreign policy. And I think what uh, the Gujral doctrine did earlier in 96-97, this does have a continuity in that sense, it's not out of the blue, but it has new life in it. We look at our neighbours with a lot of merit, not just as a big brother per se, but as we say one family. Mm. So this neighbour has extended to neighborhood which goes beyond just South Asia. Uh, so the problem that was there that we are maybe just, uh, you know, it's, it's non-reciprocal. Uh, the word that is being used repeatedly is that we don't, we don't look for anything back but we are planning to give because it's important to invest in our neighbors. So that problem definitely exists but because of this change in attitude and a little bit of continuity, there has been great uh, I think outcomes at the ground level. The people as you say, uh, one example uh, which is also my second point is that the most recent earthquake in Nepal, we were yeah. the first responder there and that is where daily lives of people are affected. The vaccine diplomacy that we carried on, even with a country like Myanmar for instance, so we gave it to the, uh, we didn't give it directly to the government per se at that point of time because there was an issue of how, who we should deal with in Myanmar. Mm. Uh, so we gave it the first aid uh, elsewhere. But the point is that we are affecting at a ground level because we look at our neighbours not just as uh, countries which are smaller in size than ours, but each of them are capable on their own and each mm. of them need to be invested in. You brought a point about multilateralism, sub-regionalism and integrity. So I think integrating uh, this region, because SAG didn't really work out despite uh, what uh, Prime Minister Modi tried to do, uh, resuscitate it, but somewhere or the other, I think there have been issues there as well. Mm. But we have other forums like BBIN, for instance. Uh, I wouldn't like to, uh, you know, overhype that forum, but at the same time, a lot of groundwork is happening in terms of connectivity, for instance, yeah. uh, in terms of... Uh, trying to be a transit between uh, Nepal and Bangladesh, for instance, in terms of electricity, trying to make a electricity grid in the region. So real integration is also being, uh, it's being, being uh, taken care of, I think, at the ground level, which is what is very mm. important. And even the outlays, uh, Dr. Sultana, the, our, if you look at our uh, development uh, finance or uh, development partnerships, uh, neighborhood continues to receive the lion's share. Um, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, um, Sri Lanka, um, Maldives, um, and then before the fall of uh, Kabul to Taliban, even Afghanistan. You know, and we would like to continue despite the you know disruption and although we don't recognize the Taliban regime there, but we want our development projects to continue. So India's emergence as a kind of a um, provider of uh, development assistance uh, seems to continue uh, to, to be going forward uh, where we show that this region is the most, uh, you know, has the highest priority for us in terms of our own budgetary outlays. And I think that the projects that we have seen on the ground, you know, and the speed, one of the things Dr. S. J. Shankar, our foreign minister, has been saying is that um, compared to earlier times, this, we are implementing a lot of these things much faster. Mm. And I remember, uh, you know, the signature initiative of the Prime Minister was the South Asian satellite. You know, we did it so fast uh, mm. and within just two to three years, I think by 2017, and uh, it's operational and it has generated huge benefits for all our neighboring countries, barring the ones, uh, the, the, the one country, uh, our Western neighbor, which unfortunately did not join it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of putting the money where the mouth is, as they say, I think the neighborhood first, we have the data to show that uh, we really uh, have, are committed to this region. So when we talk about, I think, uh, developmental projects, uh, there are 
now if you see india's developmental projects we can have two sets of projects one is high impact community development projects these are small projects mm. uh, but very very impactful because these are highly uh, these are like directly impact the people um, on ground and i think on this high impact community development projects india uh, has really uh, india has been successful because india has been finishing completing all these projects on time mm -hmm. and they are benefiting the people so that is why we don't get to hear much criticism about this high impact community development projects but uh, we do hear uh, india's uh, often in this countries when we talk about particularly when uh, i mean comparison between china and india sure, comes yeah. often that uh, anti india constituency in these countries they talk about a delivery deficiency mm. they say that india is not capable to deliver on time or uh, it's a delaying the launching the project takes so long so all those uh, issues all those criticisms come i think uh, while it's it's we have to acknowledge that fact yes i think in this area particularly delivery deficiency india really needs to work uh at the same time we have to understand some of this anti india feeling anti india sentiment in those in 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 the neighboring countries mm -hmm. they're politically motivated also because in the domestic politics we have to understand that because india is the uh, country which shares neighbors with all uh, shares borders with all these all these neighbors so india plays an important role at the time of elections in those countries india mm -hmm. india is a factor in uh, in in the domestic politics of those countries if i can give you the example of sri lanka mm -hmm. now um, usually we see whenever there are uh, india announces some projects uh, um, there will be some criticism from some sections within sri lanka mm. so uh, india ha provided this assistance uh, ambulance uh, system yeah, um, they health, have healthcare, yeah health yeah. healthcare mm. so initially when this project was announced there was a huge criticism it was felt uh, that the opponent uh, within sri lanka they were criticized saying that india will provide not only the ambulance but indian drivers will come and that they will flood indians will flooded indians will flood the service sector in uh, sri lanka and all those issues but when we initiated because uh, government of sri lanka that time they did not uh, care much about those criticism and they implemented the uh, project and i think within a short period of time it was benefiting the people so much mm. i think it's very successful people are really happy about it for example in maldives um, in this uh, india is doing this uh, greater malay connectivity project mm. it's the largest project in maldives by any foreign countries so uh, now many people that you you are aware about this india out movement in um, uh, uh, maldives and there's a strong uh, i mean constituency which is it's very vocal about um, um, against india mm. so what they are trying to criticize they are saying that india will not be able to finish it uh, on time and it's delaying it will there will be some problem and all those issues so now i think um, because it's it's got delayed because of covid and other issues the project got delayed i think uh, initially it was thought that by this year it will be uh, they'll be able to finish some part of it but i think it's it's going to be delayed now so people are getting restless so mm. in front of them the, they have example that china is a country which just started and finished it but india has started but uh, they have not finished it yeah. uh, yet yeah. but of course so, the chinese the the chinese model is more top down and not consultative and they they just throw money and you know they have yeah, a different there are lot, there are there are lots of issues actually if mm. you see when they come um, indian uh, projects when we even when we provide loans i'm not even talking about the grants even we, when we provide loans the interest rate is much cheaper mm. indian uh, uh, assistance these are transparent but chinese uh, loans we all know these are not transparent and the interest rate is so high but in front of common people they don't understand yeah, so much the and and the and, and the differences. people who are aware uh, they don't uh, you know share those information with the yeah, common yeah. people so 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 uh, dr barua the point that's being made is there is this misinformation and uh, propaganda against india we know that i mean we often come across it sometimes it may be even magnified to the right. point where it looks like this neighboring country is hostile to india but actually it's a small segment within those countries so uh, and surely i mean the chinese and others who don't want india to be the leader of this region will be spreading and supporting <coughs> some of these campaigns as well but from our point of view okay there are some so called anti india constituencies in these countries sometimes there are elections where you know um, these forces may form governments uh and then there is this you know uh, suddenly 
all the criticism that you know India lost this country right. you know and then but it's cyclical isn't it every five years uh, uh, another so-called pro-India regime may come in and sometimes people are so caught up in an individual country and that moment and they don't probably see the longer term you know horizon of how we have been doing development uh, and and neighborhood first in this whole in this country and the region so uh, how do you think we can handle these so-called anti-India forces or uh, their uh, uh, messaging uh, and what is it that we can do to make, make sure that the people as well as a wide cross-section of elites in these countries uh, remain favorable to India. Do you think, because people say sometimes we give aid, quote unquote, uh, but the, we don't get bang for the buck, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, do you think there's something we need to be doing uh, in terms of longer term planning for these countries rather than getting bogged down by is it a pro-India regime or a pro-China regime and that sort of thing. I think uh, it's like a political football, no? It keeps going this way or right. that way. I think uh, the interesting word political football in an article that Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia wrote for Hindustan Times, he said the exact same thing that we should not look at it as the Western media at many times portrays in Maldives particularly in this case that it's not a football between anti-India and pro-China. We should have a long-term view and I think that is what is also helping. Uh, but coming to more specific example, if you take Nepal for instance, mm. we've had either uh, you know KP Sharma Oli or we've had uh, Mr. Prachanda in power for so many years and that has helped China to a great extent to you know make its uh, footing into the country particularly in the connectivity and infrastructure sector but has it really stopped India as much I don't think so mm. because if you look at the recent visit by the PM in May June 2023 we have had revi revision of the uh, transit agreement as I said and they Nepal has also had that with China's in 2016 but not much has happened even in, if you look at the BRI for instance as many as I think nine projects were uh, announced uh, I think the results are still more on paper than on ground mm. so these are real examples of how uh, what is being said in the public or to give a certain kind of messaging in a certain way and what is happening really on ground also may vary a lot of times so whichever uh, government is in power in these uh, smaller countries particularly mm. uh, whether it be Nepal not so much of Bhutan Bh Bhutan did not join the BRI in fact and we've had good uh, relations with Bhutan especially in the uh, you know uh, hydropower sector and all of uh, these projects are going just fine uh, but uh, in Maldives for instance in uh, Sri Lanka for instance we have had this problem of this versus that mm. but I think with India's persistent uh, and now uh, acquired habit if I can say so so because we've not had uh, projects completed on time we have started putting a lot of our energies on completing these projects taking up a lot of connectivity projects because at the heart of our neighborhood first policy also comes in this connectivity and infrastructure sector today connecting mm. not just people not just roads not just railways but having an integrated sort of uh, neighborhood where we all benefit in real term uh, than just paper so I think uh, the long term view is to firstly come out of this anti-China uh, pro-India mindset uh, which we are trying to do despite what others say. Secondly is also the fact that uh, not everything is what we are doing outside of our country in terms of whether it's connectivity or any other project is not just simply driven by China's BRI or it's not just simply because China is doing th therefore we are doing. Mm -hmm. In fact there are a lot of other countries Japan for instance has come in in a big way in South Asia and its neighbors. Yes. Uh, we don't say because Japan is doing therefore we are doing so why do we have to particularly say that you know because China is doing now we have and, woken up and, and we are and, doing and now. And in the case of countries like Japan which are very close strategic right. partners of India we are also jointly uh, Absolutely. You know, implementing Bangladesh projects. for instance in fact uh, the Sonadia project that was scrapped but Mat Matarbari I think Japan has come in in such a big way now whether you call it that Japan is replaci replacing China and it, it's now China versus Japan or not is a different uh, you know narrative building can happen on that ground mm. but the fact that we are uh, engaging with third parties yeah. doing a lot even in uh, Sri Lanka for instance uh, East Terminal Container there are so many other such examples so there are many other countries also uh, that have come in in uh, doing these development 
projects and I think that is how we should look at uh, the scenario today yeah. uh, then looking at Absolutely. only uh, this versus that. Uh, Dr. Sultana, uh, Sri Lanka in particular, it is interesting that the US uh, Development Finance Corporation is now joining hands with the Adani Group of India mm. and uh, is going to do a major infrastructure project there. And likewise, we have spoken about Japan, Australia is also, mm. you know, all the Quad partners especially mm. have been very closely wanting to collaborate with India in third countries in our neighborhood. Mm. And if you go back like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I think we used to be very wary of uh, all these countries coming into our, you know, so-called backyard. Mm. But the China problem and the shifting, you know, geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific seems to have convinced us that, you know, we need to actually do it jointly with other countries. Mm. So this Japan India plus one, US India plus one, or maybe even broader, you know, like a whole quad initiatives in some of these countries for physical infrastructure, for digital infrastructure, connectivity, you know, all these things, I think can make a difference, isn't it? And uh, of course, it requires more coordination. Okay, instead of India just implementing it bilaterally with, mm. uh, let's say, Sri Lanka, we will need to bring in, you know, other parties and have joint agreements to implement, but still, I think that is the way to go ahead, isn't it? Uh, because uh, neighborhood first does not mean uh, quote unquote uh, Indian primacy in the region, it means to have balance in the region, right? And for that, we need more partners. Yes. I think that mindset you are talking about, uh, that uh, I think that change in 2004 tsunami, before that, our mindset was like, no, we don't want any kind of uh, extra regional powers in our uh, backyard. But 2004, I think, for, I think for the first time, we did not mind. I mean, the countries coming together and providing assistance, joining hands. So since then, I think we have seen that collaborating with other countries, even on the security, uh, defense-related issues, also like uh, on maritime domain awareness and all, I think we did cooperate. And on developmental issues, particularly as you mentioned, Sri Lanka. We we have been we tried to do that uh, with Japan, uh, mm. the East Container Terminal, but then it got cancelled. Sri Lankan government has uh, cancelled that agreement. That's a different issue. But I think there are other areas where now they have agreed that both countries, uh, India, Japan, trilateral kind of cooperation. They they are. Uh, um, I mean, uh, they, they'll prefer that. And in case of this West Container Terminal also, we have seen, as you mentioned, US is also providing some uh, financial assistance to that project, so it will be a joint uh, project. I think it is an important aspect because, uh, in as I mentioned, uh, it's not only delivery deficiency, but we ha also have to understand sometimes probably we lack resources Th that is that is a fact. I mean, yeah, we don't yeah. have uh, deep pockets as like as the China has, uh, because that is an issue for us. I mean, even though we have been providing assistance uh, uh, to Sri Lanka during economic crisis, I think we are the largest assistance provider to Sri Lanka. But uh, but but other uh, than that, uh, there are issues. Sometimes this resource uh, is an issue for us. I think in that context, it's 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 a good that if we can collaborate with other countries, mm -hmm. where uh, where we, we sometimes. Probably we will, we won't, we may not have a resource that ways, but we have capabilities. We have skills. We can provide those skills. Uh, then, uh, if we don't have, uh, like, even we can go beyond neighbors, uh, neighborhood also. Like, I'm not talking about, I mean, some of the countries in the neighborhood, like, for example, uh, uh, in, in the Pacific areas, if we can collaborate with other countries, we can probably yeah, do or that. Africa, yeah. Yeah, in Africa, we can, we can do that. Uh, so, I think the thing is, because uh, that mindset should not be there, as, as you mentioned, that when there's a regime change, um, like, for example, if uh, not uh, a pro-India kind of government is there in power, do we completely isolate or what should we do? Mm. I mean, we try to collaborate with other countries and we should be there. And, and, me, and in my understanding, uh, we should always try to be present so yeah. that, with that, that you know that vacuum is not created. That, that, is, that is very important. Yeah. So we try to, I think, um, see my, at bilateral level, trilateral level, <laughs> multilateral level, that engagement, I think, is the key. Absolutely. Uh, Presence and engagement are key. Uh, Dr. Barua, last comments. We are almost out of time. Um, going forward, the China challenge, the China shadow will remain. But I think initially we were jittery about it, but now we are seeing more confident India where we are saying, okay, we will be able to handle them and uh, we have our own strengths and our own unique advantages and we will put them forward, which the Chinese cannot match. 
and culture and there are so many other things which bind this region to India that the Chinese cannot boast of, you know. So I think going forward, uh, material as well as non-material and more symbolic uh, ways, including high-level political attention, this is the way forward. There's no, uh, you know, silver bullet to solve the, you know, right. the, the neighborhood in a, the ideal way we want. There are problems. There is some resistance from some vested interest groups, but uh, I think we are plowing ahead. I think so too. I think what uh, Dr. Sultana also mentioned is that we may not have had resources earlier which we are now catching up on. Earlier our projects used to be um, mostly on uh, you know like a housing project for instance in Sri Lanka or softer projects, developmental projects. Now they are India is taking up larger projects. Earlier we took up the Kaladan project, did not deliver on time, had issues but now we have learnt our lesson and I think we are taking uh, you know more careful steps as to what we can complete or not. So yes, I think we are doing better. Also the China factor, like I said, uh, we can't pitch that versus India per se. We have other players, we need to engage with them and go ahead. And one of the last things that I would also like to say is that uh, India's position today, as we have all seen with the recently, uh, you know, with the G20 summit, it's much more at a, uh, at a global level, it's much more strong today than mm. previously, which also has an impact on how others are looking at the country. Absolutely. So I think that is what is helping India today. Right. So viewers, uh, the sum of this discussion is that uh, India is rising, India is uh, catching up with China, India is going to be a great power in the world, hopefully in the next 10 years or so. And so the expectations of the region of uh, neighboring countries is also going to be higher. They uh, want more from India uh, in terms of resources and loans and investments and uh, grants, but also uh, they want to be treated as sovereign countries and India is quite sensitive about this and uh, does not um, do the things that uh, authoritarian countries like China do, which is to interfere in the internal affairs or try to manipulate domestic affairs in these countries. So we need to break through the uh, web of misinformation and see how a democratic uh, rising power like India uh, is making a positive impact on its region. I want to thank our two guests, uh, Dr. Uh, Barua and Dr. Sultana. Thank you so much for sharing such valuable insights. Thank you, thank for you having so much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Great. So viewers, uh, Neighborhood First is uh, still work in progress, but uh, we have a lot of accomplishments and we continue to uh, face uh, some challenges in implementing this uh, in number of countries. We need to look at each of them, uh, each country by its own merit, but also the region as a whole, we need to have long-term strategy and uh, rest assured uh, we are working on making uh, South Asia a more prosperous and stable and balanced region. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.